I'd also like to recognize Senator Joe Vitale, who's the chair of the uh, New Jersey Health Committee, and also Rick Goldstein, the president of New Jersey's Council of Teaching Hospitals. There may be other folks I should be recognizing, but uh, I know I want to recognize at least those two gentlemen. To launch our series, we have the honor to hear from Dr. Owen, who's the president of our state's medical school, which holds the distinction as the largest health sciences university in the country. As almost all of you know, UMDMJ has received a great deal of high-profile criticism in recent years. That paradigm shifted dramatically last year with the appointment of Dr. Owen, a nationally recognized expert and leader in the field of medical education. With an incredibly distinguished record of success earned at such places as the University of Tennessee, Duke University, and the Harvard Medical School, Dr. Owen has undertaken the challenge to harness the potential of a massive university system that encompasses five campuses and more than 200 different affiliated partners. His arrival heralds a new era for UMDMJ and by extension, all of New Jersey. We are grateful for his willingness to speak this evening and we look forward to hearing his views on the role such a dynamic entity like UMDMJ plays in the delivery of health care in the state of New Jersey. Dr. Owen, please. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to add a third category to those that you offered. You said leaders and experts in health care. I think you should also include bullseyes. There you go. Since very often that's the way I feel. Um, I am assuming that I'm forwarding from here. Of the many things that have been ascribed to Yogi Berra, this is one that he genuinely said. You don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. And being relatively new in my position, this is exactly the issue that I pose to myself. Where the heck are we going to end up? And hence, I thought this was an appropriate venue to begin to address that issue with you. And toward doing so, I want to look at the health university and pose a query. And that is, does the health university generate a social or societal product? Should the health university be expected to do so? And certainly in a state like New Jersey, where there is a substantial fiscal crisis and the health components are those that are being scrutinized in this context. It's a valid question. Should market forces be allowed to manage what has historically been managed and in fact even owned by the academic health center and its components? So I want to start in the with a, what I characterize as a pulse check of the healthcare system in the United States. And I'm going to start with, of course, the issue of national spending on healthcare, which, as you appreciate, is now up to almost $2 trillion and composes a double digit of our gross domestic product. Now, the other way, and I think a more poignant way to look at this in the context of societal products, is what is the burden on the individual? And you can appreciate we're now over $6,000 per year per person on average spent toward health care. Now what's striking for me is you appreciate we just had an increment in the minimum wage and if you calculate that out per year you're looking at about $16,000. Put that in the context of an employer. It is cheaper for an employer to now bring in a minimum wage employee than it is often to share their burden of the cost of health care. Hence, is it any surprise that we're seeing more and more people no longer being enrolled in health care programs by their employers because their employers are no longer offering them? It really becomes a P&L based decision. I think another way and a very provocative way to look at health care in the United States is to look at what was described as health care efficiency or health system efficiency. 
and I've defined efficiency for you in the bottom right of the slide. Efficiency being what is the attained health care as a ratio to what is the maximum amount of health care that can be offered. Now I recognize that this is soft and fuzzy around the edges in terms of what is attained and what is maximum, but nevertheless the same sort of biases and confounders are offered across the board and the United States surprisingly ranks 37th. But on the other hand, the expense per person, the national expenditures are number one in the United States. So then, does it come as any surprise to some extent that you see statements like this? U.S. Today, ABC News poll, 60% of Americans were, quote, very dissatisfied, end quote, with high national health spending. Harvard School of Public Health survey, 43% named high health costs as one of the two most important government issues. And then in the New York Times and CBS poll recently, 90% of Americans agreed that the U.S. health system should be rebuilt or fundamentally restructured. I think it's particularly interesting looking at that information that I shared with you in the context of viewing this at another level with a little greater granularity. About 60% of people think that the health care cost as a personal burden is excessive. But then if you ask them about the government and the expenses, now remember that first slide, $2 trillion, only 11% think the government is spending too much on health care. Seventy percent think the government is spending too little. And that fourth column that I've added is the percentage of people who were in favor of S-CHIP even after the president vetoed it. Now it looks like you've got a bit of a contradiction until you again drill down even further. And what's reflected here is opinions around the performance of the health system, which as you can see, whether you look at coverage, cost, or quality, most people think is problematic. But then if you look at personal experiences, so it's now individualized, it's not that bad. It's kind of the, you know, ain't bothering me phenomenon, but I think something is awry. So how do you account for what is an obvious disparity? And I would suggest that the model of how most individuals interact with the healthcare system is best characterized as a principal-agent relationship. What do I mean? The principal, who's the patient, typically is unaware or cannot observe the effort, the skill, the performance level of the agent. Who's the agent? The agent's the provider whether it be the physician provider, nurse provider, <laughs> dentist provider, or the health system. Think about that. I would suggest that most of us know more about the plumber than we do about our health care provider. And let me just offer some issues related to such. This was a quite provocative retrospective cohort analysis of a large national database in terms of health outcomes. Now several hundred indicators of care were examined on chart review as well as physician interview. And these are process indicators. So for example, in that first category there, congestive heart failure. Did the patient with congestive heart failure get a prescription for an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, an ACE inhibitor? Pretty conventional standard therapy, best demonstrated practice. Did the patient with diabetes have a hemoglobin A1C, glycosylated hemoglobin level measured? And I can continue through, so several hundred of these. And so in these diseases, you can see by example the number of indicators that were used as a measure of quality of care, dichotomously. Was it done or was it not done? You can also appreciate that in different of the category, for the most part, fewer than 80% of these quality indicators were followed. 
and for the overall aggregate group, only 55% were followed. Now think about what I'm telling you. I know what's right and only 55% of the time is it implemented. Let me offer another example of what I would suggest are some challenges and some confounders related to that agent-client relationship. This is a headbanger map looking at influenza and pneumonia death rates. These are routinely produced by the Centers for Disease Control. A number of these exist across diseases. This is for influenza and pneumonia. Why did I pick this? Because I picked two disorders that I would argue are a reflection of process. Death rates from influenza and pneumonia are arguably a function of vaccination rates in these areas. The darker the color, the worse the outcome. By the way, encircled in red is New Jersey. Now for those of you who think that maybe people in the South have an environmental exposure that's different or are constitutionally different. You know, there's one problem with these sorts of headbanger maps. If I just go across a state line, I see a difference in the incidence or prevalence of diseases. So do we really think, by example, that South Carolina, for those of you who don't know, South Carolina's in the south, in the right-hand corner there which is adjacent to Tennessee. That's that long, skinny one there in the middle. Um, you change borders and something happens. I suggest you're seeing a reflection of practice patterns. State ranking by quality of care, provocative data from then Admiral, Admiral Steve Jinks. Again, an aggregate score, rank order of care processes. And again, Dark blue, in this circumstance, the darker the color, the worse. And by the way, or should I say the better, and by the way, there's New Jersey. Bottom quartile. Now one thing that I find particularly interesting here is that we often talk about health disparities. And I've heard apologists say, Oh, what you're seeing with these sorts of disparities in process outcomes is the ability to navigate the health system. Or maybe it's gender differences in perception of health, or maybe it's uh, socioeconomics, in particular the latter. Well, I find Steve Ash's paper here particularly provocative because it's so bad, I can't see a difference across gender, women in pink, men in blue, race, Black and white, age, old versus young, income levels, wealthy versus poor. It's pretty confounded for all. I guess that's the good news and also the bad news. Hence, is it any reason that many of our patients feel incredibly confounded and many of the payers are saying the healthcare system is biting off the hand that feeds it. For those of you who are concerned, I want to reassure you the crocodile was not injured in making this picture. <laughs> so the next thing I'd like to do is spending a few moments describing what is an academic health center. That's what I run. Now why would I do that? I was out a few weeks ago with a former very senior elected official and his spouse. Someone came by the table that I did not know, and he stood up and kindly introduced me to the person, and he said, this is Dr. Bill Owen. He's the head of the medical school. His spouse corrected him. Oh, no, 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 he's not head of the medical school. He's head of the hospital. And my wife corrected both of them. He's not head of anything. I'm head of him and head of both. <laughs> So let's start with describing an academic health center. There is a formal definition because we have a society and to be honored by paying those large dues, you have to kind of know the fireside dance and the secret handshake. And the code to learning those is that you are a system of health colleges, colleges, educational units, with or without an embedded healthcare delivery organization, ah, service that is accredited to educate undergraduates, so toward terminal degrees and graduates, postgraduates, in disciplines of healthcare. 
So here's a query. Is an academic health center a school or is it a service organization? Many of you have children recognize cat dog, hence you know the answer. Yes. Let's talk about that a little bit. We'll use UMDNJ as an example. Of the approximately 124 academic health centers in the United States, about 65% of those have three or more health colleges. The minority have all of the schools represented. By the way, that's where we live in that. We have health-related professions, we have nursing, we have several medical schools, both allopathic and osteopathic. We have dentistry, and we have graduate health education. <laughs> now, this is our seal. And what am I calling out here? Well, you see three components of that seal. A service component on the left-hand side, teaching component upper right, and a discovery component in the bottom left. So you hear schools, academic health centers talking about their sacred triad of missions, education, clinical care, and research. Missions, I will return to that in just a moment. Picture of a tricycle, why am I showing you that? Well, this assumes that there is an egalitarian approach to executing on those missions. Wheel one, clinical care. Wheel two, education. Wheel three, discovery. The reality is that most academic health centers look like a big wheel. Remember this thing? It had a big wheel in front and two wheels behind it. Let's look at those as missions. It is to say that the missions of most academic health centers are not balanced. Let me offer an example. Mayo Clinic, the big wheel is clinical care. The research, the teaching is focused on improving that. Let me give you another example of a big wheel, and that is uh, my old institution, Harvard. The big wheel in front is discovery. It is research. The other two wheels are used to drive and, and to improve on that front wheel, move that big wheel forward. And I think this is a fair characterization of most academic health centers. Now, what did I mention earlier? How can a single integrated organization have missions? Peter Drucker tried to study academic health centers and said they did not make sense. They should not exist. How can a single organization that is integrated have missions? That sounds counterintuitive. And I think it is reasonable. And I'm going to offer you a couple of examples of that schism. <laughs> Trustee Broach, as you can see, those doggone clinicians are just propping up the research organization. That's fascinating. If I go and talk to those same clinicians in that organization, they say, oh my goodness, if we could really get things going on that clinical service, we could get some traction for the discovery. So there's an inherent friction to an awful lot of what we do. And let me give you another example. And that is the hospital and the medical school. And this can even be the circumstance of where the hospital is embedded in the medical school. Why is that? Well, think about a hospital. A good hospital with a dynamic board of directors or board of trustees is focused on that p &L. It's a p l based organization. But what about that medical school? There are lots of things that you do in a medical school, which of course composes an academic health center, that you just simply say, I really don't care about the P&L because it defines what I am to do. And I'm going to return to this because this is critical to the issue of whether or not an academic health center and its schools can generate something of societal value. It is this kind of funny looking slider. I think this is a yellow eared, eared, eared slider. I hope he's in Trustee Broach's lab for study, is illustrating. Now, for academic health centers, there are certain attributes that are useful that describe tier one centers. 
I'm going to share with you the result of a case study done by the RAND Corporation 20 years ago that is still applicable in defining a top-tier academic health center. And why was it character characterized as top-tier? Not because U.S. News and World Report listed it as top-tier. Goodness knows, if you're not on the list, you certainly criticize it. If you are, you laud it and put a sign in your lobby. But rather, what they did was they looked at academic health centers in economically challenged environments and looked at centers and what sort of common characteristics could be identified that characterize growth in that sort of environment. First of all, there was entrepreneurship at all levels of the organization, the individual, the division, the department, even at the level of the school. And by entrepreneurship, I am defining it in the conventional French definition, which is to say controlled risk taking. But on the other hand, the organization, when necessary, was able to come together for collective and coordinated action. Thirdly, oh, what a surprise, rewards and recognition aligned with productivity. You eat what you kill. Revenue transparency and reallocation, especially for faculty generated revenue. Why is that so important? Well, remember I stated earlier, there are things that define an academic health center, that define a component of it, like a medical school, that do not have a positive margin. They don't even have a neutral margin. They have a negative margin. I was taught recurrent years of negative margins is the definition of insolvency. So how do they not become insolvent? The re revenue from the higher revenue generating units is reallocated. Remember this point, we will be coming back to it. And then lastly, expanding, yes, I hate to describe patients in this way, but as market share. Now let's talk a little bit about the revenue sources for an academic health center. I think this is probably one of the most poignant differences in terms of an academic health center as a health university versus a conventional university. Tuition and fees, pretty straightforward. As you know, the conventional university relies very heavily on tuition and fees. State appropriations or money that is spun off by your endowment. Thirdly, external advancement, which can be categorized into two groups. One is program-focused federal appropriations, as we entitle them down south, good old-fashioned earmarks. By the way, that is a badge of honor down south. And then development. Faculty-generated revenue, facility-generated revenue, the place where the practitioners practice their art. And then lastly, appropriations for innovation. Now what do I mean under that rubric? Grants and contracts, intellectual properties, in other words, inventing things, getting paid for it, either as cash or as equity interest, and then interestingly enough, monopolies. What do I mean by a monopoly? If I invent something, introduce it into the marketplace, it is known pretty routinely that you get paid far above market value for your monopoly. Why do you get paid above fair market value? There is no fair market value yet for it. And so ten, the compensation tends to be excessive. Now, this is UMDNJ, which has about a $1.7 million, or sorry, billion dollar a year budget. And what I've done is shown the revenue by sources for UMDNJ. This is not atypical for an academic health center. I draw your attention, for example, to a couple of areas. First of all, that light green one there, which is tuition. 4% of our budget, tuition, 4%. Faculty generated revenue there. Illustrated in blue, 15%. Site generated revenue. These are clinical care components, 35%. I'm gonna return to this issue of revenue and revenue diversification around the issue of societal roles. Now something that's fairly interesting for me is where are academic health centers located? And to illustrate this, I'm going to take you back to Tennessee. This is a headbanger map by zip code. This is the University of Tennessee's main campus, which is located in Memphis, Tennessee. And I've got a nice little star there for 
the zip code in which it exists. Now what I'm illustrating on this headbanger bat map is infant mortality rates for a two-year period there in Tennessee and in Shelby County, which I believe still has the highest infant mortality rate in the United States. I'd love to do this for one of our counties here in New Jersey. Don't have the data yet, but I'm going to be coming back to you with it. But what am I calling out here? Well, again, remember I told you the dark of the color, typically the worse the outcome. Look at where the worst infant mortalities are, juxtaposed to the academic health center. So does that mean that being near an academic health center increases your risk, like putting your house next to the prison increases the likelihood of a break-in? I think not. I am reminded of what Scott Morris, who is the director of the Church Health Center, once said. Virtually every doctor in America learned on the body of a poor person. A reality, most academic health centers are located in areas where the greatest health disparities are. Now think about that. Your next generation of health practitioners are learning on people where some of the worst health outcomes are. Sounds like an opportunity to me. And I want to share with you a quote that was given to me, which I think is somewhat germane in that it reflects an awful lot of appropriate criticism that has been raised about academic health centers in terms of their societal role. When there's a problem, he does not want to hear about it. When he hears, he does not listen. When he listens, he does not understand. When he understands, he does not follow up. And when he follows up, it always is with half measures. Now, based on that headbanger map I showed you earlier, do you see why those who appropriate at a federal level for graduate medical education, who very often say, wait a minute, this is welfare for doctors, paying them to be trained, also are very much the same people who often say, you folks live in your ivory towers like in 17th century France. And you have a clientele around you that you use as a reagent in an experiment. You have a clientele around you that you use as a resource for teaching. You have a clientele around you that you use as a subsidy for income, but you don't give a lot back. So I'm going to pose two complementary but opposing queries. Why should an academic health center enjoy a relatively protected status, which we do, in prestige, power, and resources? Or the contrary question is, shouldn't an academic health center participate in a free market? And I think it is a valid question, and it is increasing in vigor, as one finds resources are increasingly constrained. And the idea of an academic health center participating in a free economy is not an odd one. Let me return to Wealth of Nations that advocated that free, unregulated economic competition would maximize profits, boost quality and innovation, and create a division of labor and make prices reasonable. Competition was referred to as, quote, an invisible hand which kept the economy stable on both a macro and a micro level and orderly without the need of any external designers. So I want to kind of look at that in the context of the academic health center and the challenges that I have offered are present. First of all, let me try to answer the question. And again, the answer is yes. Academic health centers provide two types of commodities or goods. One of those are common services, things that I suggest should participate in a free market economy. It should be unregulated, that there should be open competition around. But the other thing that's kind of funny about AHCs is that they have services that are so distinctive, that are so expensive, are so poorly reimbursed that a competitive model would not support them. If they were a corporation and we had EPS, the board would say the earnings on those is so poor we're not going to endorse your continuing on those areas. 
And I am arguing that those areas are our critical societal value. But I think if we look at the issue of revenue diversification in academic health centers, I'm going to suggest that there is an approach that will allow us to serve and participate in both areas and improve on our mission. So first of all, let's call out what are some unique services for an academic health center. First of all, education and training, which I think is best characterized as consumer protection. The reality is that the period of supervised training, both pre and post, is unique in healthcare. There is no other that is as long. And why is it there? It's mandated. It's to protect you as a consumer. But the reality is to train a student, to have a student training in your venue, although there is extraordinary payments, it's called graduate medical education dollars, which are offered federally as well at the level of the state, it still does not cover cost. The reality is, despite the wonderful experience of having trainees, I can tell you firsthand, making rounds with a trainee takes longer. It lowers my efficiency. It costs the provider money, whether the provider is either a hospital or is a practitioner. Another unique service that a P&L approach would not support is research. And it is the reality that in enterprise organizations that do value research, they are relatively risk averse. I remember in, when I was on the dark side at one time having to go and present programs of wonderful scientific value, but there was prior art associated with it. And therefore the development costs would be incurred on us, but someone else would take advantage of that and then go and develop the same product. So things like probability of reaching market net present value are entered into conversations about science and discovery. And these are econometric measures, folks. That sort of basic science research is challenging for enterprise organizations at some level. They pick and choose. This is why I would argue most discoveries, most transformational or what are platform discoveries occur in academe as opposed to an enterprise organization. And then there is another type of research, and that is applied research, translational research, the often overused moniker. It's undervalued, it's undersupplied, and is not paid for. No one will pay you for improving a therapeutic procedure. Most new diagnostics are not paid for. Comparing off-patent medicines is not paid for. Implementing a best demonstrated practice, remember that 55% I told you about? No one's going to pay you for it. Yeah, those of you who are thinking about payment for performance, perhaps during the question and answer session, we can talk about that a little more, better described as value-based purchasing. That doesn't get paid for, but where are those discoveries made? In the academic health center. Another unique services, patient services. Academic health centers provide a disproportionate amount of care to poor, underinsured, and individuals who cannot navigate the health system. And of course, as I, we talked about a little earlier, market forces discourage care where there is no margin. Who would invest in a firm that loses $10 for every unit produced. It's like the bad joke. Uncle Suki had a suit factory. He made $18 for each suit. It cost $20 to make the suit. Oh, he made it up in volume. <coughs> now, I'm going to be schizophrenic, and I do not take medications for this. I presented to you earlier education and training as being an area in which the services were so unique, they were so costly, that market forces should not be allowed to oversee them. But there are components of education and training that I would argue that market forces 
can and should be brought to bear. First of all, our profession is composed of lifelong learners. What do we do? Did I say we had a dichotomy of missions? One of those is education. Continuing education is in medicine, nursing, dentistry, etc. That should be subjected to market forces. Let the person who teaches the best class get compensated. Enterprise organizations. They have people at entry level. They have people at mid-level. For example, their development organizations, their regulatory affairs group, their sales force that can and should be taught as lifelong learners. That, too, is a process that is not so unique as an educational process that it should live with academic health centers alone. I'll give you another example of my schizophrenia research. I talked about in the revenue diversification of academic health centers the category of appropriations for innovations, inventing things and then commercializing them and turning them into products. That, too, is something that market forces should be allowed and brought to bear in terms of managing. Patient services. The Walmart model. I see a couple of people snickering. It sounds like you must be from Arkansas, man. I'm going to take a moment to tell you folks about uh, Sam Walton, who was a real and very colorful person. And I hope I can put what I mean in perspective here on the Walmart model for care. Sam Walton did have a pickup truck. It was a large one, and he would have goods in the back of his truck. Now, this was a very smart businessman. He would pull into town, flip down the gate on the truck, and the goods would have prices on them. The goods that were closest to the gate, so that you could reach to most easily, were priced below fair market value. So they were deeply discounted. Ah, wow, that cup is really cheap. The items that were further into the truck were priced at or above fair market value. Well, I don't need a cup, but boy, I need a pitcher. Let me reach over and get a pitcher. Ah, but I think it's going to be cheaper because that cup was really cheap, but it's really not. Ah, now how the heck does that apply to health care? Anyone care to guess what percentage of services in a quaternary care, big fancy academic hospital, are unique as compared to a tertiary care, so a really fine community-based hospital that doesn't have residents and fellows and the grand professors walking the halls? The more liberal guess is 5%. Most studies have shown only 3%. Why the heck then do I drive past the hospital that is in my neighborhood, which is got the same kind of services, to go down the street to the fancy quaternary care hospital? Ah, because they discover things at that fancy hospital. And even though I might not need that health service, I still think everything else there. Just like I thought was cheaper on that truck, I think those other things at that hospital are unique as well. That's the pull-through effect that we talk about. That's the halo we talk about. Sure, I can get aspirin for my heart attack at any good hospital, but oh, because the professor gave me the aspirin, I bet that's a better aspirin. It's an interesting model because it works, folks. And as you can appreciate, there is such a rapid penetration of technologies through the health community that it means you have to have a robust pipeline of discovery going into that quaternary care hospital to keep things unique and to keep things different. This is an example of something that I think should be allowed to be subjected to market forces. If we had more money, we could. This was the statement that I heard most frequently during my environmental scan at UMDNJ. If we had more money, we could start a new lab. If we had more money, we could expand this service. If we had more money, we could put a neon sign on top of our building. So let's talk about financing 
the academic health center in terms of providing social assets. I'm going to return again to the query posed earlier of is an academic health center a school or is it a service organization? And you will recall I said it is cat dog. The answer is yes. This is UMDNJ's budget. What I have done is codified it based on those categories that I shared with you earlier of revenue streams. Ah, what was the answer I saw most often for the blank? If we had more money, we could. No, Senator Vitale, this is not directed at you. The answer I heard most, if we had more money from the state, we could, about 25% of our budget. Can I see a show of hands of people who believe in fairies? Are there any unicorn people here? Yeah, I'm kind of in that group as well. All to say, what did I talk about? There are other areas of revenue that can be used for diversification and revenue enhancement that I would argue is an obligation of the Academic Health Center to take advantage of. And I'm going to hopefully show you with a couple of examples here that by focusing and executing particularly well on those, the Academic Health Center can also contribute to developing a social product. I'm just going to give you two examples of where you can take a piece of this pie and expand it. One would be tuition and fees, as I've mentioned to you, and this is typical for many components of academic health centers, less than 5% of the total budget. Well, what did I talk about earlier? The issue of lifelong health learners. Pursue development, pursue certification. Even in an open market, I would e argue that academic health centers have an advantage in that area. Another one is clinical site-generated revenue. What did I talk about? Again, without a special appropriation, without a special service, the Academic Health Center can partner vigorously with its hospitals to pursue the Walmart model for health customers. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of very tangible real-life examples that have been executed. And the first one I'm going to start with is the Delta Regional Authority in the context of diabetes mellitus. Back in one of my old lives, I get a call from the commissioner of the Delta Regional Authority. The Delta Regional Authority is a traditional federal economic development organization. Why the heck would he be calling the chancellor of a university? I don't build roads. I've never helped design a dam. I don't open plants. But I'm just going to offer to you an example of what he talked about to me. This is the prevalence of diabetes in 1994, and as you see the screen darkening, again using our convention, darker is worse, the prevalence of diabetes in 2004. It's a genuine conversation. Chancellor Owen, do you know what one of the factors that's germane to you in terms of determining where a plant is located? No, sir, I do not. Isn't it taxes? Yeah, it is taxes, but taxes is below this now. Oh, give, what is it? Oh, it's the cost of insuring the workers. And guess what? That hits the bottom line of all these plants. And they ain't into altruism. They're into EPS. So if we have a healthy workforce, our cost of insurance goes down. The profits go up. Productivity goes up, and we're going to return to the issue of productivity in a moment in another example. We want to have structured programs at state and regional levels to improve the health of the workforce to attract people into those areas as economies. The flip side is when they come in and the diligence team looks and they see, oh, the fattest county in the United States, the most unwell state in the United States, it's deleterious. Folks, I remind you the Toyota plant is in Arkansas out of a choice of other places. I bet you New Jersey was one of the places that offered it, not because 
the workforce is cheap, but because the state has embraced a state mandate to intervene on diabetes. Any of you seen Mike Huckabee? Know how big Mike Huckabee was several years ago? Who became a poster child for a state that embraced diabetes and got his academic health center behind it in terms of developing intervention programs to improve the health of the workforce and hence improve the bottom line. Give you another example, again, at kind of a macroscopic regional level, asthma. What's the most common reason working age mothers don't go to work? <coughs> Kids homesick. Why is a kid homesick most often? Most common cause of missed school days, asthma. Guess what, folks? Asthma management doesn't make a buck. Diabetes management doesn't make a buck. You can't rely on market forces to manage those. In fact, I'll tell you an ugly secret, pediatricians in the office, in, in, the, in the audience, I apologize. But if it were based on P&L, you would not have a pediatrics department in any hospital. I don't care how hard they work, how smart they are, how subspecialized they are, it is unusual for a pediatrician, especially in an academic environment, to have a margin. Oh, didn't I describe that as insolvency? Well, how do I make that go away? They have a positive margin because I reallocate, usually from the neurosurgeons and the people who do all sorts of fancy interventions, to those pediatricians that I absolutely need. And who can, on the other hand, as I said, influence at a societal level. And also, hey, guess what? Improve the attractiveness of a state economically. I'm going to give you kind of a microscopic example, a real example. Anyone here familiar with Dress for Success? For those of you who are not, this is a wonderful initiative in which women who are well healed will take their clothing that is in the closet and vexing their spouses and give it to other women who are in need. So it's part of a very creative rehabilitation, jobs rehabilitation program. You know, when you go for an interview, you want to look good. You want to feel good about yourself. The analogy for a man is, I've got a haircut. A little thing like that makes you feel good. For a lady going to interview for a job and looking, looking well makes her feel better and she presents herself in a different way. Now there's another program called Hope Six. Now if you folks are familiar with it, federal program, I think the last Hope Six grant was given out about two years ago. Very interesting program in which individuals who were living in somewhat impoverished areas had their homes demolished and new homes were built and they were given an opportunity to own the homes but you had to sign a contract that you were going to work. You were going to enter the workforce. Well, historically, Hope Six, as I recall, over 75% of the participants are women, single mothers. Ah, sounds like the candidates in dress for success. Well, I'll tell you a true story. My wife came home one day because she started working with dress for success, and she said, you know, I noticed that the women that I'm engaged with speak to me like this. Why? Poor dentition. Exactly. The other piece of it. So, where does that relate to an academic health center? Ah, I have students who are low-cost care providers. We established a program in which you're enrolled in Hope 6, you then enroll in Dress for Success, ah, we've got another carrot for you. You come to the dental school and meet our cosmetic dentistry students and we deeply discount the service. Boy, is that contrary to a P&L. But guess what? Makes the Hope 6 program work and I now have these people actually back contributing to the workforce again. Little examples of how an academic health center can kind of do things that the competitive marketplace will not nor should not allow, if you ask me. 
I want to kind of conclude talking about accountability and expectations for academic health centers. And I am calling this out because I am very comfortable with two of my bosses now here. Hello, Trustee Shapiro. What you should expect for us. Let me share some of these things in the context of creating a societal product. First of all, academic health centers, and certainly UMDNJ, welcomes increased scrutiny. Look at us. Look at how we perform. Make us earn that special status that we enjoy. Success for us should be defined along all of our missions, and these include social missions as well. Those unique services that I called out for you earlier. Success should be defined preemptively and as quantitatively as possible. I'm very comfortable saying that UMD and J will and other academic health centers should be evaluated on their contribution economically to the state in which they're located. Let's talk about jobs creation. And I'm not talking about some soft and fuzzy, oh, I'm going to take my graduates and say, oh, I created a job. I graduated three doctors, so I created three jobs. I'm talking about a conventional federal definition of jobs creation. Because again, the special service, the special contribution that we can make, we should be held accountable for. We should embrace process improvements. We're big businesses. UMD, as I mentioned to you earlier, about $1.7 billion. That's about a Fortune 1000 company. So have the same expectation for managerial maturity and performance that you would of any large business. And then lastly, revenue diversity should be sought as our primary strategy to fund an egalitarian societal mission. Boy, I can tell you, I am unpopular with my colleagues at the Association of Academic Health Centers. Hey, so be it. I want to conclude by sharing a story with you. I shared some of this in speaking to some colleagues, in particular in New York City, and kind of phone was very silent at the other end. And so my colleague quite honestly pushed back. And he said, well, Bill, that all sounds good, but you MD and J, man, you guys are just an old sleepy turtle over there. So I said, yeah, maybe we are old sleepy turtle. Could you send me your email address? And he sent it to me, and I sent this picture to him. <laughs> So I want to thank you all for allowing us an opportunity to state that UMDNJ is going to show up very differently. I welcome an opportunity to work with you and to work for you. And I do think competition's good. I think accountability is good, and I think transparency is good. Thank you all, and I'll take questions if there are any. So thank you very much, President Owens, for a terrific, uh, terrific discussion. Those of us who care a great deal about UMDNJ and who uh, look to UMDNJ to be an important force for social change and for improving the health of New Jerseyans are very grateful that you're here and that you've begun so brilliantly to reform our state medical school. We have plenty of opportunity now to take questions uh, from the audience. I'm going to. Um, Throw you a hardball, though, first, if that's okay. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> I, um, I actually do know the county by county infant mortality rate data mm -hmm. for our fair state. Um, what a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was, uh, that was great. Uh, that was great. And uh, I'll be your straight man, and I'll tell you that it ranges from about three uh, in a thousand um, uh, in the northern part of our state, Morris County. Yeah. It's not quite so low, just next door. It's amazing. In Essex County, it's about two and a half times that. And it goes down to a high of about 15, 15 and a half in the lower part of our state. 
Uh, in fact, there are towns in the south part of New Jersey where the IMR is about 30. Um, and so the question to you, and I'm not going to ask you the obvious one, why is there such a disparity in a state where the average rate is five and a half, better than the national norm? Why is there such a disparity? But I'm going to ask you how UMDNJ, working to its social purpose, um, working not only in the service of teaching and research, but also in the direct clinical service of the people of our state, how can UMDNJ engage this <coughs> problem and other problems like it? And then after that, we'll take some hard questions. One of the things that's interesting about academic health centers historically is what I characterize as a dirty secret, and that is that there has been a caste system based on the type of activity that has been provided in the academic health center. The caste system had this rank order, starting from the highest point in the caste, and that was the scientist. The great scientist was venerated, and the great scientist was rewarded most handsomely. Then I go one level below, and that was great teacher. And if you weren't a great scientist or a great teacher, they tell you, go see patients. So you were at the bottom of the caste system. The good news is academic health centers have recognized going to that big wheel model, maybe that front wheel of research was too large. Now where am I going with this? I envision that the practitioner who is using best demonstrated practices, and that's a nice way of saying using evidence-based medicine or adopting uh, literature review, structured clinical practice guidelines, and more importantly, performance measures. And then secondly, the practitioner who is an early adopter. Usually it takes about seven years for something to be promulgated through the health system as a new discovery, even if it is something that will improve care and is a best demonstrated practice. Those academic health center practitioners who are there or who do so are different, and they should be rewarded for such. So this kind of caste system where you're a really fine doctor, good for you, and that's the end of it, that's got to stop, and I think it should stop. So going to your question, whether it applies to infant mortality, asthma, heart disease, you take your choice of diseases. I see a near future state, certainly for many academic health centers, including UMD, where we begin to define and reward the great practitioners. So what can we do? We can help identify those people, and we can help provide some special and unique rewards for those sorts of people. Because a lot of the, to return to your example, excessive infant mortality, Sure, some of it is patient-specific and patient-related behavior. But I would suggest that a lot of it also is provider-related behavior. And so the high mortality is a surrogate for both. I can't make mom stop smoking, but I can sure make sure her doctor tells her to stop smoking. We're open. The floor is open. Yes, sir. Um, yes. Um, I'm a uh, recently retired
their immediate constituents. Uh, and it's very seldom extensive in New Jersey as a, uh, as a whole. Uh, and what this has resulted in, we got the Oxford Catholic School, I don't know if you're familiar with this, because we needed the, uh, the votes of the South Jersey legislators to get an income tax in New Jersey. And what they wanted was an Austria Catholic school in New Jersey. We got the Camden, our Camden branch of Robert Lee Johnson because uh, then Congressman Florio, later governor, uh, wanted a VA hospital placed in Camden. And in order to do that, he needed a medical school because at the VA had to be a Dean's Hospital. Uh, and so we had gotten to develop the Camden facility, and Jimmy Carter was replaced by Ronald Reagan, and no more VA Hospital. Consistently, this medical this university has suffered because of the politics within New Jersey. If you go way back into the creation, about how this university was put together and the battles, political battles, is still here. And uh, um, you know, I just wonder how you feel as you begin your first full year as president based on the 15% budget cut, which what it means is your faculty members are already told that they have to see more patients to generate more, more of their uh, university-based salary. Researchers are told that they're going to have to get more of their uh, uh, salary funding out of their research grants, which means less for postdocs, supplies, equipment, and things of that, uh, of that uh, nature. The teaching has actually begun to deteriorate. How are you going to deal with all of this? <laughs> Serotonin uptake inhibitors. <laughs> to the day. <laughs> uh, before I give a response, I um, <laughs> have to offer a, a little bit of a disclaimer, which I'll do in the context of a story. A preacher was walking down the road, and he hears a lot of noise in front of him. Of course, he's wondering what the heck is going on. And as he gets closer, he sees it's a bunch of young boys, 8 to 10 years old. And they're just gesticulating and yelling wildly. And as he gets closer still, he sees there's a dog in the middle of this gaggle of boys. And of course, he's concerned that the dog is being mistreated. As he gets closer, he then confronts one of the boys and he says, what are you doing? And he says, we found this stray. He's awfully cute. And we all want him. So we decided we're going to have a contest to see who gets the stray. And whoever can tell the best lie gets to keep the dog. Well, of course, the preacher was pretty taken aback by and he decides that he's going to give them a lecture about lying. I don't care what the circumstance is. There's nothing to justify lying. I have never, never in my life ever told a lie. And so the boys kind of quiet down and hang their heads. And the preacher is proud of himself because he knows that he's gotten through to her. And finally, one of the little boys looks up and he says to the preacher, well, I guess you get to keep the dog. <laughs> so when I answer questions like you're a sir, I want to make sure I'm not the preacher. <laughs> all that being said, I think when you first of all hear statements that in a harsh budgetary environment. There is a 
egalitarian 15% cut? No. I'm into strategic budgeting. Uniform cuts assumes that all things are of equal value. Big organizations, all things aren't of equal value. Some of the higher values than others. The trick is to find out which ones are of higher value and then having the maturity and discipline to resource those of higher value. So I can tell you at 10,000 feet, some things are gonna see a cut, some things are gonna stay neutral, and some are gonna see an increment in the budget. I'm not yet prepared to tell you which, because I don't think our teams who have been tasked to answer those questions are able to yet answer them and come to reconcile across one another around those. But I think it opens up the bigger issue. You know, I showed you the budget diversification for UMDNJ, and we had codified it along the unique lines that academic health centers can raise money. So what did I say? 25% of UMDNJ's budget is a state appropriation. That's good and bad news. For me, it's a bit of bad news because it defines a vulnerability. The good news is it's only 25%, 75% in every one of those categories, sir. I can tell you has an opportunity for us to hit a societal stride as well as to compete in the marketplace to increase our revenue. It's not an <coughs> acute answer, but certainly I reassure you that the university is very committed to actually leveraging revenue from those other sources. This goes to the final thing that I want to say, and that was my list of values or areas of accountability for the university. What did I call out as our last one? The university should be committed to revenue diversification. We ain't kidding around like that. I am not like the preacher in that one. So. Uh, Take you up on it. I'd love to teach. <laughs> Are there uh, questions or uh, comments? Yes, sir. So just kind of a, a similar question, but we find you can like the oh, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, oh, oh. So, so I have a, a similar, along the same lines, but it's more geared towards research. Um, I mean, it's no secret that our federal government hasn't been as committed to scientific research as one would hope with the NIH budget not growing as fast as it should due to, for lack of a better term, just prior obligations. And um, additionally, with the, with the outcome of the next election, there's probably a strong potential that it's going to be more of a socialized medicine scenario in the United States. So what would be the mechanism for keeping air in the tire of your big wheel that's research? I think the kind of fundamental challenge for funding research in the United States is what is the philosophy of what I'm funding. And let me clarify that a bit. There have been detractors of academic health centers who have said, you know, actually, we can drop the budget for extramural federally funded research by actually driving, and there are lots of ways you can drive it. One, of course, is to change the patent laws, extend them, I discover something, I actually can draw value on it for a longer period of time. Another is I can offer tax credits for new discoveries. But basically, shift the burden of discovery, and I burden's the wrong word, shift discovery from the academic <coughs> environment to the enterprise environment. Oh, they're good, they can do it better. There's one problem I have with that, and that is something I alluded to earlier in the conversation, and that is what do I do for the discovery that may not have a strong economic value? The ENPV isn't great on it. I'll give you a great example where there's not a prior art associated with it. And let's say that it, i can give you a disease I worked on, the idiopathic hypereosinophilic syndrome. Boy, if you see one of these in your clinical lives, good luck for you. This is a rare disease. You're not going to invest a lot of money 
in caring for a rare disease or finding a discovery for a rare disease, especially if it's difficult. So in circumstances like that, what is the role of the government, which I think has a role in terms of serving a common good for funding research, for things where there is prior art, for things where there is not a good ENPV or a bad probability of reaching market, for things like, I'll give you a great example where we ended up going to the federal government for funding, is two medications, both very costly to develop, the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors versus the angiotensin receptor blockers, both out on the market, both making tons of money. Uh, man, who's going to pay for that study? Because, man, I might, what if I'm wrong and I obsolete my product? Boy, I'm going to get fired. So the philosophy in my mind of government is that a lot of discovery where there is no economic value either yet or ever will be should be funded by the federal government. So I think first of all the government needs to decide what the heck it's going to do in terms of funding and its role in federal funding. I think first of all if you adopt that philosophically you end up saying you know there is a heck of a lot of opportunity here in the United States. By the way, I don't think that it is a coincidence that at the same time that there was the best level of funding for NIH and NSF was also the time that we had the greatest growth in inventions that were of mercantile value for the country. I think they are linked to one another. As you said, we've got competing exigencies right now in the country. And in that circumstance, it's like everything. You can't do everything. And to return to the professor's question, what are you going to stop to start doing something else? Way above my pay grade to make the decision, but I think you hope, I hope you can appreciate my bias. Bill, a, a question kind of on this notion of value. So I'm a 25-year-old and I'm looking at interventional radiology and spine surgery and I'm looking at primary care. And we've seen what CMS and managed care attempted to do and, and were not at all successful. We've seen the recent ACP white paper on the medical home. So what is the Academic Health Center, in particular UMDMJ's role and mission as it relates to value for patients, a lot of which is basic care, versus value for physicians and how physicians are compensated? Yeah, Professor Peskin. Um, it's, it, what you're describing is a really tough issue in that the payer for health service is obviously trying to define or gather the greatest value that can be obtained for a dollar. But on the other hand, academic health centers have a perspective which in many ways goes back to how they've evolved of being egalitarian in healthcare. As much as is needed for all, we're going to be relatively blind to your ability to compensate. I don't know how to reconcile those. I don't know if it's a case of, you know, I have the marketplace define what's the best way to kind of balance out use of services and access to the services, which is the, I'm going to set up health accounts. And as you know, we got two presidential candidates, who, or should I say one presidential candidate who's in favor of that? Or is it an approach of, I'm going to take the money that I would spend for unregulated care and put that into a universal health care system? Then I've got another issue of Massachusetts, a spectacular example. Great, I've got you insured, but by the way, I don't have enough primary care providers to see you. Um, I started out with data suggesting that an awful lot of the populace is unhappy at the macroscopic level about the system. I think the fix is literally going to, at some level, probably have to be macroscopic. The thing that frightens me about the fixes that occur at the level of the states is do we end up with a system where there is so much disparity 
from one fix to another that people wholesale pick up and migrate to one area versus another. And I'll tell you, I'm colored about that coming from Tennessee, where we had TenCare. And TenCare, in its last year before being restructured about three years ago, cost more than, or was predicted to cost more than was expended for K through 12 education in the state. It was gonna consume 35% of the state's budget. And guess what? People moved into Tennessee from surrounding states because it was a great service. So I'm a little concerned about regional approaches to the kinds of harmonization that you're demanding be put or suggesting should be put in place. It's got to be a better harmonization. And again, you know, I'm not a policy guy. I don't know how to fix it. The final point I will say, though, when I've got 124 Fortune 1000 organizations, boy, oh boy, we should be commanding a lot of, of attention and I would argue should be master architects in terms of developing a solution because arguably we're the most dispassionate and certainly have the loftiest goals. Wish I could give you a little more precise answer, but ain't smart enough. Dr. Irwin, I was interested in your comments on uh, transparency and accountability, which were exciting. I'm interested in what you see as the consequence of that accountability and transparency. Academic medical centers have traditionally lived in safe harbors, or some have referred to them as most favored nation status uh, when it comes to certificate of need, when it comes to regulated programs, when it comes to quality measurement when it comes to cost accountability. Uh, so what do you see with your transparency and accountability agenda uh, should be the consequence of that accountability if uh, objective criteria are not accomplished? Sure. You know, I was snickering to myself, and I apologize. I wasn't laughing at you. I was laughing at your remark about, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, accountability and transparency is good. It's just such a core value to me. It's like when somebody says, thank you for coming to work. You know, it's got to, you do it. Um, the, the, toward answering your question, I'm going to try to answer it a little bit lower than 10,000 feet, but probably can't do so in this sort of venue, because I think what is valued by a state and we're a state organization, will vary from state to state. That being said, I think that a state, and more importantly, the citizens of a state, should have ready access to those sorts of things that measure whether or not an organization is, first of all, being a good steward of their resources, and that's money, that's the venue, that's the buildings, et cetera. And it's also something interesting the professor raised, it's their talent. And what is used as the metric of that, I think should go beyond a PL. I'll give you an example of transparency that may vary from state to state. I think it was actually you, Professor, who talked about New Jersey being, as I characterize again, net exporter of doctors. We're not there yet. We're getting close to being there. There are some complicated reasons. It's not just simply the quality of our residency programs. And there are other states that offer other confounders as to why our doctors do not stay in New Jersey. But all to say, let me use Tennessee as an example. I came to Tennessee, did my environmental scan there. I was told Tennessee citizens want the University of Tennessee to be a tier one research institution. Hey folks, guess what? When I got out and started talking to the people in the halls, and these are a lot of different halls, you know what they told me? They wanted to Tennessee to train doctors. So one of the metrics that we put in place is how many 
many doctors do we train that stay in the state? And in five years, if I haven't approved that by XYZ amount, you come wrap my knuckles. If I have improved that, you give me hugs. That then means that I institute programs to make sure that I'm going to be successful. So I think the transparency, certainly there are baseline things that we should be transparent about, like what we're spending our money on, what the quality of faculty life is, what the outcome is for the patients. But for me, transparency should go up to another level and should reflect what people value in the organization, or should I say, from the organization, and we be held accountable. And if we don't deliver, as I say, wrap us on the knuckles. And there are a lot of ways you can wrap an organization on the knuckles. You can do it at the level of talent management. Hey, I don't do the job, fire me. You should. You can do it in terms of the appropriations. Well, hey, you know, you're not performing. I'm not going to continue giving you money. I'm not going to keep paying for the lazy brother who's laying at home and can go out and work. But hold me accountable as well in terms of not only what you visualize, but what you execute on. Hope I've answered your question at least philosophically. Dr. Owen, uh, thank you very much. In your career of experience in, in the nation, as, as you look across the country at all the 50 different public university systems, is there a model out there or a couple of state systems that if you, all things being equal, would like to lead us towards being like them 10 years from now, whatever? Um, you happy to hear your answer? Trustee Shapiro, I'm not saying this just simply because it's your old school. I really like Michigan. High performing in a number of levels. I like the fact that it is a state system. It has a presence across the state. Yeah, there are other competitors out there, and I think the competition makes them good, but it is a state system. That's an area where I'd like to see UMD show up better. Right now, it feels like fiefdoms. I've got a castle in northern Jersey, a castle in middle Jersey, a castle in southern Jersey. There are lots of reasons for that. I've heard people describe New Jersey as three states. That's somebody else's issue. That's not mine. I want us to be a state system where we're integrated, coordinated, harmonized, and focusing on issues across the state. I'll tell you. You know, when I look at health-related matters in Essex, hey, guess what? They ain't much different than they are in Camden. And don't tell me two hours is a half-hour drive is a big distance. I used to get on a plane to fly to my nearest campus in Tennessee. I think I also like a system like Michigan, Michigan because they discover things. And I'm not talking about discover things in terms of what is regulating a gene. It also includes discovery that is at, as I describe it, not bench to bed, it's at bench to curbside, healthcare delivery models that are novel and that are important and that, that they roll out. It is a highly accountable organization. So that's the kind of place that, you know, if you ask me who's a peer, I had some team members come to me and they said, here are peers. And I said, what is this? They said, well, these are our peers because this one's located in this area and this one's in this area and this area. They were geographical peers. I don't want geographical peers. I want aspirational peers. And just as a final point, sir, I've not seen anything in terms of UMD's challenges that are unique to UMD. And that's important for me. Because that means that others have been successful in designing and implementing solutions. And we ought to be reaching out to implement those toward driving ourselves to being tier one. I, I think I'll be forthright. I think we're good, solid, middle of the pack. It's the Olympics. Ain't nothing wrong with being good, solid, middle of the pack. But I'd like to have a gold, silver, or bronze medal. And I think our folks here deserve it.
when you choose that in the numbers. Now, debt forces many people to uh, assume uh, the need to go into these hyper-paid specialties. Uh, New Jersey is not generous to its students. We're amongst the highest in terms of in-state tuition in the United States. Uh, how do you deal with that? Take some money from Princeton University to help make it be blind? I'm going to give you the name of my development officer, and he will be calling you tonight. <laughs> um, you know, first of all, let me comment about the debt issue for those who might not be familiar with it. Certainly everyone knows that medical school is expensive. For those of you who are not aware of this, you're absolutely right, sir. Our tuition is actually one of the highest in the nation uh, for a state school. Why does that become germane? The level of indebtedness now for your typical medical school graduate uh, coming out of a state school is up to about $130,000 a year. Okay, folks, think back to when you were youngsters and graduating out of school, coming out with that sort of debt boom the payments are starting to come. Yes, it does influence the choices by our young people. And as described, there seems to be, whether or not this is the sole driver or not, there certainly seems to be an increased propensity as the indebtedness rises for certain specialties to be selected. And in fact, I'll extend on what you've suggested, sir, and that is it also greatly influences where these young people go and practice their art. What a surprise, there's some counties, whether in Jersey or around the country, where the reimbursement is higher than others because of the uh, quality in terms of reimbursement of the patients. Some pay you more than others. Final point, and to expand on what you said, is many in the country, and I am part of this group, feel that there is a maldistribution of physicians. We got plenty of docs, it's just they're in the wrong specialties and in the wrong areas. And in fact, this is the debate, as you can well imagine, that is occurring between the Liaison Council of Medical Education and the Association of American Medical Colleges. One says, and I, I love this, double AMC says, oh, we'll just increase the number of doctors, the base will go up. And I love the way it was put by the, D, I believe it was the dean at Dartmouth, oh yeah, we really need some more neurosurgeons in uh, New Hampshire. All that being said, uh, I agree with you. One of the things that was striking that I commented to Trustee Shapiro about during the interview process is how few scholarships are available for our students here. That's something that needs to be fixed. I think I showed you on the pie chart that um, we've got less than 5% of our revenue coming from development. The wealthiest state in the United States. I raise more money than this in Tennessee, which is a poor rural state. I think that's a spectacular opportunity. And one of the things that I've committed is to dedicate some time and energy to focused fundraising for our students to get more scholarships. I don't know in the contemporary uh, fiscal state of New Jersey if there is even the money available for special set-asides for students who practice in certain types of environments. Uh, we tried that in Tennessee, ended up not being successful. It was interesting. The kids came out with a lot of debt, went into dermatology, no, I'm not picking on your skin doctors, and just paid the debt back off, and then practiced where all the bright lights were. On the other hand, the folks in Mayo, very interesting, developed a very powerful and seems to work regression formula that allowed them to predict which type of student would practice in an area that was economically disadvantaged. And, um, and by the way, those are both rural and urban areas. And I think that 
that sort of change in perhaps the demographic of our entering class, incentives for our class, lifting the burdens for our classes will help to get more doctors to stay here. Folks, I'm scared about us in terms of our doctors and their propensity to leave Jersey. This is non-sustainable, sir. And again, one of the things to return to your query, what sort of things should we be held accountable for? I think that's one of the things that I should be held accountable for in my organization. I don't know what the right number is, but you are gonna be hearing from us now that I've completed my environmental scan, a statement of here's our goal in terms of slowing this down and us taking a real leadership role with some other important organizations like the Council of Teaching Hospitals, like the Medical Society, but we gotta fix this. I have a strong sense that the university historically was a partner by funding activities. You go to UMD and ask UMD for money and ask UMD to provide a service. I don't like that model, and the reason I don't like that model is we don't have enough resources. We have to pick and choose in doing so, and I think it becomes almost like Oliver Twist singing for your supper. You do a good presentation and kiss the right rings, I'm gonna give you a lot of porridge. And if you don't do a good song, then you don't get as much porridge. I've had some pretty sincere conversations with my organization around what is community service, which is the first question, and then how do you execute on it? And for those of you who don't have an opportunity to think a lot about community service. It is not a trivial question to answer. What is it? Because there's several models of community service and academic health centers have to varying degrees embrace different types. There's one type. And one type is, interestingly enough, the patient is a reagent. So I'm gonna reach out into the community and I'm gonna capture patients for my studies. And those might be studies where I take buffy coat and blood, do off of blood, or they might be studies where I come in with an intervention, or they might be studies where I look at what happens in an uncontrolled environment, like an outcome study. So that's one model of community service. Second model of commun and community service is where the academic health center is a resource for content expertise. So I need to educate the population and I'm gonna to go to the, to the venerated professor and ask him or her to come and educate the population. That might be you know, the, the public service spot or the radio show. Third model of community service, and that is the organization Alpha Test New Healthcare Delivery Model. Give you a great example. Anybody here heard of the Diabetes Mall by Sam DeGogo Jack? Very interesting. Sam went to an old abandoned mall in Mississippi, near Jackson, Mississippi, and cut a deal with the state to get the rent deeply discounted because the state had taken it over and said, I got a novel healthcare delivery model. Since transportation and access to care is very challenging, for indigent people, because I got to take off from work, goodness knows, I got to get transportation there, gas at $4 a pop, that's a challenge now. What am I going to do? So, what Sam did was he took each of the abandoned storefronts and put a specialist in there. Bus goes in the neighborhood, picks everybody up, loads them up, drives them to the, it's called the Diabetes Mall. So I see my diabetologist, I see my cardiologist, I see my foot doctor, I see my social worker, I see my nutritionist, all in one setting. And by the way, I use a lot of 
allied health professionals to drive the cost down. So I train a family practitioner to do a slit lens exam versus paying for an ophthalmologist to do it. So a novel healthcare delivery model. Guess who came up with it? An academician at an academic health center. So it's a community-based healthcare delivery model. And then kind of the last model that I can think of in, in kind of codifying this is uh, that of where there is a burden of a disease in a community, and at the end of the day, you don't make any money on it. You lose money. I was talking to someone a little earlier coming in, and they said, we got some real exciting projects we're working on, and one of them is sickle cell disease. Man, oh man, you show me a sickle cell patient that pays for his or her care at the end of the day. But it's a burden of disease for some communities, including this one. Well, community services, I'm looking at the burden of the disease quantitatively, and I'm going to take a loss, which means I'm going to reappropriate for something else into that to provide that community service. So why am I going through all of this? Well, academic health centers need to decide which of these are going to get their arms around. And we had some very deliberate conversations around this and the timing was special because we approached well we just passed the date of the <laughs> signing of the 40th the 40th anniversary signing of the Newark Accord so I thought it might be a good time for us to look at this and so how could I do all of the four because I don't have the resources and what we came up with is that we can be the facilitator which is to say you need something and it fits into one of these categories of community service, come talk to us. We'll get you to the right people in the organization. We'll loan you some talent to teach you how to do something. We'll be available for you. But we don't have the resources to resource that. But we'll certainly get you started. You know, it's the old corny, I'll teach you how to plan it and then you grow it. I think we had one final question. Oh, yes, sir. We did, right? young lady up here. Oh, yeah, always ladies first, being a Southerner. Thank you. I actually, I just wondered, I think I heard a discussion about Rutgers. Mike there. Perhaps some potential partnership with Rutgers. Is that something that you would be interested in? I've heard some discussion that Rutgers may be interested in a potential merge with the medical school, and sort of the proponents of that idea say that it would potentially raise up both institutions and perhaps create a model more like what's in Michigan, and I wondered what you thought about this. Yeah, I'm not certain which model of geographical realignment you're describing because I think I'm up to six and then I just finally gave up because each one was a little different. You know, I'm going to take speaker's uh, liberty here and answer your question a little differently than the way you posed it, which is to say, is there optimal integration, is there optimal synergy and leverage of resources and most importantly talent between the institutions? Absolutely not. Which way to fix it? I don't know if it's just simply a matter of a realignment. You know, there used to be this joke that we would tell in Boston at Harvard, and that was, if you need a piece of equipment, it, don't go write a grant. It's probably the investigator next door that you don't know. Proximity and that sort of alignment does not define collaboration. Collaboration is really something that's driven by management in terms of rewarding collaborators to get it initiated and then having them see the value of it. We have some wonderful examples of where collaboration has been of benefit. Eoshi, CABM, the Cancer Institute, we have investigators from multiple institutions they are working together. That, by the way, is a whole lot cheaper than geographical realignment, but I'm not the person to decide, and I'm not the person that's smart enough, but I will tell you, I do think the goal that was sought, whether you say it's being sought from the Vagilus report or being sought by others, I think at the end of the day, the demand that, univ that um, New Jersey deserves, tier one institutions, whether it's a health university or not, is absolutely right. We're pretty well resourced. We ought to do better with what we have. This gentleman had his hand up. I don't want to be respectful to him. Sir? 
I thought you were my cousin and I owed you some money. <laughs> well, I think uh, this was terrific. I wonder if you would join with me and uh, thank Dr. Owen for uh, being with us for two hours. Thank you, Dr. Owen.